speaking in the UX and the product and the Agile communities for about three years now. And before I did that, before I got into Agile, I was a product manager. So that was my first job. And I did product management and UX design. I didn't know that they were two separate things <laughs> because they were like, go do it all. And that's how I started off. So I eventually got into Lean Startup, then I got into the Agile community, so I've been a little bit of everywhere. And, but product management is my home. That's what I do mostly. So last week, I was at the Mind the Product conference in uh, London, and I, that was the third time I was there too. And that conference, to give you the span of it, is 1,400 people. And it sells out every year, and they have 500 people on the waiting list. And it's one of the only conferences for product managers of any kind of discipline all over the world. And people travel from all over to come to this thing. So I was there giving a workshop. Um, and over the three years that I've been um, doing workshops there, I haven't heard many speakers talk about Agile. So they do a one-track um, conference on the second day, about 10 speakers. And I've heard it maybe mentioned once or twice in passing, but this year was different. This year, nobody really did a talk on Agile, but one speaker who was very big in the product management community got up there and he said, uh, as an aside, I'm not even going to get into Agile. And the entire audience laughed. And we're like, OK, where is he going with this? Um, <laughs> so I start listening now. And he goes, I, oh, OK, fine, I will get into it. I hate Agile. Agile is all about velocity and points, and they don't give a shit about the user. And 1,400 people started applauding. And I sat there and I went, uh oh, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> and Jeff Patton was also in the audience with me, too. He was also giving a workshop the second day, and he, he tweeted about this. And a lot of people in the Agile community went, uh-oh, <laughs> over the tweets. So the thing is that over the last couple of years, I've been working with product managers who've been adopting Agile in all different types of industries. So big companies, small companies, like very large enterprises, you know, 40,000 people, 50,000 people on the technology teams. And I kind of understand where they're coming from. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about product management and Agile, some of the problems that I see happening, the things I've observed, some of the things I'm trying as a solution. I don't know all the answers, but I hope this starts a discussion for us of where we're going. So product management is a new thing anymore. When I first started, nobody knew what a product manager was. I, I would be like, oh, I'm a product manager. And they're like, what's that mean? <laughs> and I had to explain to them. I never, I never started with my title. I always just gave them an explanation of what I did. But that's different now. And now we have prod, uh, product owners in Agile as well. So no matter what companies I go to, though, I started to see a trend with their agile development, where they're transitioning. And it seems to me that everybody's kind of doing this safety dance, right? <laughs> so most of the companies I work with are doing this safety dance. And when I talk about safety dance, too, what do I mean? I mean they're doing a lot of um, motions and, and dance moves, but they have no freaking clue why they're doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what happens is people adopt this, and they think everything's wonderful and great, and it's going to make everything better. Um, so they start shipping features faster, which is what it was promised that they would do, and they start piling up. So then the user is like, all right, what do I do with this? So the user is now inundated with like all of these features and all of these products that people are shipping out faster now, but they're a hodgepodge of complexity, and it's because our backlogs pile up and we just start shipping things out to them, but we're not actually thinking about why we're shipping them or if this is the right thing to actually ship, or does this actually solve a problem for our users? And that seems to be the trend with a lot of the features and a lot of the products we build, which kind of reminds me of this product, right? Um, that seems, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I'm pretty sure like a product owner made this from a backlog, because they were like, what else can we add to a printer? Well, let's put a stapler in there, and a printer and a scanner and a faxer and everything, right? Let's put all the things into this one thing. And the problem is, you don't know how to use it. I've stood in front of this type of machine for about 45 minutes trying to just print something, and I have no freaking clue how to use it. So what happens is, this is still relevant from 1998, <laughs> right? <laughs> it breaks. It doesn't make any sense. And I think that's really what's happening to our products today. Also, when something breaks, what do we do? We go, oh, let's just add something else to the backlog to fix it. And then we'll ship that, and that will fix it, and everybody will be happy. So 
Then I come into these companies and they go, well, we need to train our product owners because we're shipping all of these things and they're not making our users happy. So our product owners don't know how to prioritize. <laughs> so I come in and I teach the product owners about discovery and delivery, how to figure out what your users actually want, how to experiment around it, how to deliver value. And at the end of my workshops, I always get the same kind of response from our product owners. They go, well, that's lovely, but you know, I spend 40 hours a week writing user stories, so I don't have time to actually talk to the customer. And I'm like, how many user stories do you have <laughs> if you're spending 40 hours a week doing that? But this is reality. They say, I have no time to do this because I'm writing user stories. So they go, I say, okay, if you're writing user stories, who's talking to the customer? And the answer is either, I don't know, or <laughs> that's, more, that's mostly the answer, or the product manager above me. So I go, okay, I'll go talk to that person. So I go talk to the product manager above them, and they were usually promoted from a product owner to a product manager, and I say, when was the last time you talked to users? And they go, two answers, either a year ago, I talked to them once for like 30 minutes, or, oh, I don't talk to users, there's a team over there that does user research and I get a report. <laughs> so this seems to be the state, and then they go back to doing their backlogs, and then they ship things out, and the customers go, what is this? So we end up in an infinite loop, right? And this is what I call the build trap. Um, and a lot of companies are doing this today. And the build trap is a scary place to get into because we're not actually, we're so focused on velocity and we're so focused on shipping more and more features that we don't stop to think about, are these the right things that we should be shipping? Are these the right features that are actually gonna solve a problem for our users? So that's a very dangerous trap to get into. Um, so the thing I wanna answer today and start off with is, how did we actually get here? How did we end up into the build trap? Because this is what most companies are doing. So there's a couple reasons I think we ended up here. <laughs> I killed Chris. Um, <laughs> there's so many more memes in here. Um, <laughs> so there's a couple reasons we ended up in the build trap. Um, but I think one of the things to remember is that agile processes don't have a brain. So we've adopted Agile. I do love Agile. I like teaching people about Agile. But the thing to remember here is that Agile processes don't have a brain. Uh, they don't tell you, they're very good at telling you how to build products, but they do not tell you why you should build products. And that's something to distinguish because we don't do that when we actually go into companies and teach technology teams how to do this. So what do I mean? Most people are using Scrum, for better or for worse. And also, I admit, most people are using Scrum poorly. Right? They don't understand all of the nuances to it. They're doing those motions, the safety dance. They don't know why they're doing it. But the thing is, Scrum was never really good at product management at the beginning. So the definition of the product owner, when you look at Scrum, was this from, by Ken Schwaber. So he says that the product owner is also the customer and the business person inside your company. So that is the person that you have to deliver value to, right? So for years, I'm reading the Agile Manifesto and going, oh, you guys are doing Agile wrong because the first principle is our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And I'm going, you're not paying attention to the user. That's the customer here. Like, that's who you should be providing value for. So all these lean and lean UX techniques and product management techniques I'm teaching, they're very Agile. But then <laughs> I talked to some people who made the Agile Manifesto, and they were like, oh no, the customer was that business person who sat over there in marketing, and they were the ones paying for our IT development. Because back in 2001, that's how it was, right? So the cost center was the IT team, and the IT team got a budget from the business to go build things for them. So they were trying to satisfy the person internally, not the user at the end of the day. So Agile's never really been good at product management, and that's the thing to really remember. So 1,400 people applauding that you know, they hate Agile is where this is coming from, because that's still how we teach it today. We still teach people to satisfy business people by gathering requirements, and this is where we're getting stuck. This is where we're getting trapped in the build trap. So the thing I want you to remember today is that Agile is not enough. We actually need more. It's not the thing that's going to solve all of our problems. And that's why I really like this conference, because we don't talk just about Agile here. 
We talk about lean, we talk about strategy, we talk about how to make cohesive companies to actually achieve our goal. And that's why I like coming here, because we get to learn all about it. And we know that Agile is not just enough. So in addition to you know, the strategy and the culture and the great processes to keep us all moving, we also need great product management. But a lot of people are doing product management wrong. And a lot of companies don't understand what product management is. So I want to talk to you about some of the problems I've observed with product management in these companies and how we can go back and try to start fixing them. So one of the first problems is that we treat product strategy as a plan. So most companies, treat product strategy as a plan to execute a certain number of features over a certain number of time. But if you've been in any good strategy talks lately, and there's been tons of them, you'll understand why that's a little wrong. But this is still the way I see it. So one company I was working at, um, which I'm gonna tell you a lot about today, is a food delivery startup. So what they would do is they send you ingredients and recipes to your door in a subscription model, and then you open them up and you cook all those ingredients and make delicious food. So I was helping them out, teaching them product management and coaching Agile on their development teams. And one day we were, you know, we're going towards trying to reach our goal with acquisition and we're, we're really building all these products and the CTO, we're not building these products, we're experimenting at this point. The CTO barges into my meeting and he goes, okay, this is all fantastic, but what's your product strategy? And I said, oh, great, well, sit down, let me explain it to you. This is where we are now. This is where we're trying to go. These are all the experiments we're trying to do to get there. This is what we've learned so far. And these are our next steps. And he goes, that's fantastic, but that's not what I want. I want you to give me a document with your content strategy. And I want you to list out all the fields that you have in there um, and tell me how they're gonna map to the front end of the website. And I want you to deliver this by Friday. And I'm like, I don't know what the answer is to these things yet. Like, we're not done experimenting. But this was his form of a product strategy. And he came from Amazon. So this is also what Amazon thinks is a product strategy as well. So something to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> so this is the thing. Most companies think that product strategies are a wish list of all the features that we want to build, right? They're the things that we're going to do over the next year. And that's also what our roadmaps look like, right? They're Gantt charts of when we're gonna deliver those features. People are still using these in the context, um, and that doesn't really work. So the thing is that people don't realize that creating great products, um, you have to deal with uncertainty there. There's so much uncertainty that you have to deal with. Does my user even have this problem? What's the best solution for it? Are we on the right track with the UX? Will they use it? Do I understand all the context about when they're experiencing the problem? There's so many questions that we have to answer before we can even start coding, before we should start coding. And it all starts with trying to figure out how do we make a cohesive plan to actually get there. Not a plan, a cohesive strategy to get there. So product strategy emerges from experimentation. This is how we figure out where we should be going. But it's something that we don't do. So, Product strategy to me is not a plan. What, the way that I teach it is it's a system. And it's made up of visions, goals, constraints, and where you are now. And we look at that and we try to figure out how does it result in the desired outcomes for our users in our business. So you always have to have users and business balanced, right? If we pay too much attention to our users, we would give them everything for free and our business would suffer, right? But if we pay only attention to the business, our users will go away. So we're always in a careful balance here trying to get desired outcomes for both our business and our users, that way we both win. So this is what product strategy is. And the best way that I've really found to explain how to do product strategy is through the unified field theory by Bill Constantino and Mike Rother. So um, Mike and Bill do Toyota Kata. Has anybody heard of Toyota Kata before? Woo, yay, lots of people. Um, so these are th practices that I've been using that I'll walk you through. And they've adapted it from the Toyota, um, Toyota process. So Mike has been studying Toyota Kata, he's been studying how Toyota works and how they strategize and experiment around it. Um, and to me, this really clicked when I saw it. I said, this is how we should be making great products here. So the way that this describes it is that we start with our current state, where we are now. We have a challenge, which is our first big goal that we wanna reach on our way to our vision. So this is the current state of things. We're here at this moment of time there's tons of problems that we could solve, tons of directions that we could go into, tons of features we could build or ideas, but we have a threshold of knowledge, right? We are only aware of so many of these problems and these features, 
And the first problem is that our target condition, the first goal that we need to get to before we reach our challenge, is outside the threshold of knowledge. So this is kind of where we are now. We're at current state, tons of problems, tons of things going on. We only know so much, and we're trying to reach a goal that's slightly outside our threshold of knowledge. And the way that we get there is by navigating through an unclear territory by experimenting. So what we do is we experiment around these problems, around solving these problems, around learning more about them until we reach this target condition. And the target condition is our first stop on the way to our challenge and then ultimately our vision. So visions are made up of many challenges and challenges are made up of many target conditions. And what this does is it guides us through achievable goals all the way to our vision. So that vision is some really lofty thing, right? It's something that we're gonna try to achieve in five years or 10 years time down the road. Our challenge is something more near term, and our target condition is something very close that we can reach. I'll give you all examples of this in a minute. So what we do is we solve that target condition and we move a step closer to our visions and our goals. So what does this look like in real life? Um, I've been using this thing called a product strategy canvas um, where I just made this into some sort of a map and a statement for my teams where it outlines what we're going to do as a product strategy to actually reach the vision of our companies. So with this product strategy canvas too, we start off on top with the vision and the vision is set by the leaders of that business line, the CEO or the person who's really controlling that product that you want to, you want to move towards. So the person with the most knowledge on the top the challenge is set by the middle management, the ones a little bit lower. And then their teams set the target conditions. Their teams go in and try to figure out where should we be going to actually reach that challenge. So the teams set that and they understand where their current state is, where we are now. So that's how we really make a robust product strategy. So when the guy came in and the CTO and he said, what is your product strategy? This is what I tried to explain to him. And ultimately he wanted me to hand him a document, which I just ignored. Um, and I said, no, we're going to do it this way. And this is how we went to achieve it. So what is your product strategy? For this company, this food delivery startup that was um, delivering ingredients and recipes, our product strategy at the time looked something like this. In five years, this food delivery startup will be a top dinner option for the target mar markets. So they didn't want to replace you cooking at home or going out to restaurants. They wanted to be that third option that was regularly in your routine. So in their target markets, they want it to be, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays that you would order. Maybe you cook Monday and Wednesday, right? And you go out to dinner on the weekends, something like that. They want it to be in the habitual um, dinner routine. So our first challenge is the team kind of looked at what do we need to do to become sustainable, right? To become a profitable business, to actually move forward. And acquisition was a big thing on their minds. So they said, Really, in order to compete with our competitors, in order to sustain our business and become profitable, we're going to have to double acquisition by the end of 2016. So that's what the leadership team set for the team that I was working with, and we had to figure out how to get there. So we went back. Um, so the leadership team sets this, and I think this is really important. Product leaders are not dictating what features you should be building. They're providing you with a clear set of visions and goals and guardrails. So guardrails are your constraints. Where can you move within? What does our business actually want to accomplish? And then they get out of the way and they let the teams figure out how to get there. And that's something that we're not doing now because most product teams come in and they say, go build me a feature or go build me a product or I want to launch like this product in this industry, go build it exactly to a T. So this is not good because it doesn't let the teams actually figure out what's the best solution. They're giving these biased solution ideas and making them go build it. So good product leaders following a good product strategy would do something like this. They would set the vision, the goals, and the guardrails, and then let the teams figure it out. So we had to figure out where our target condition was, and we had tons of ideas like flying at us while we were trying to figure this out. So when I came in, I said, what are you doing right now to try to solve this? And they're saying, well, we understand what the customer problems are, right? The customer problems are that the price is too high, or um, we just have to rebrand the sign-up funnel, right? It's not in this new beautiful brand that we launched with this new beautiful design, so it's really hard to use. They cannot try it for free. That was a big one. That was a huge one on the marketing team. They're like, if we give out free trials of our product, people will get hooked and they'll start buying it. Um, we should be offering 
sign-up gifts. They wanted to put knives into these boxes. This was like the biggest thing that the marketing team wouldn't let me do, and I, I kept trying to tell them, no, it's not a good idea. They were like, let's just put knives in the boxes. I was like, you can test that. We don't have to build it. Um, or the photos are not enticing, right? We're going really micro here. Maybe it's, we shouldn't put steak on the homepage because people don't like steak. So these were the list of problems that they had that they were trying to explore. So we really had to figure out what was the real problem because these are surface problems. These are not really the real problems. So we dug into the data and we looked at things and we observed that, you know what? A lot of people are coming to the web page. Like tons of people are coming to the web page. So it's not that it's not enticing. It's not that our marketing is off. And if we increase marketing dollars, we're not going to get any more people to the website. We've got lots of people landing. But what we found is that they're all dropping off on this one page, the address page. So when they get to the address step, they drop off. So we said, what the real problem is, is we have to increase our conversion rate. So we don't need to spend more money with marketing. Marketing's fine right now. Something's wrong with our website. Something's wrong with the product that we built to get people onto our platform. We have to figure out what it is. So we set this goal for ourselves saying, we won't have to spend any more money if we can increase that conversion rate. And we compared what our conversion rate was to the industry standards, and it was very low. It was just not where it should be. So we said, let's increase this. Let's try to experiment around this. And that's how we'll try to figure out which way we should go in. What's the right solution for this? So now our product strategy looks something like this. So in five years, this food delivery startup will be a top dinner option for our target market. In order to reach our vision, we need to double acquisition by December 2016. Our target condition now, in order to reach our challenge, we first need to increase conversion rate across all platforms by X percent by the end of Q2. So we're giving ourselves about three months, four months to do this. And our current condition is we know what the, the conversion rates are now. So we measured it. We know where we are. So once we actually have this, we can start using the product kata. So the product kata is a way to systematically experiment towards your target condition. So it's a scientific way to really observe your obstacles standing in the way of you reaching your target condition, experiment to solve them, and then move closer. And what I love about the, um, the product kata is that it teaches you to learn, right? So this is just Toyota kata, which I've been using for product management. So that's why it's called the product kata. But what it really focuses on is making sure you learn every step of the way. And that's what's so powerful about it. So how do we actually start using this? Well, we said we know where we are. We have our conversion rate. What's our first obstacle? We said we don't understand why people are leaving. So before this, too, we're, we're doing these experiments before we really had a solid product strategy of where we're going. We're A-B testing photos. We're, we're like changing little messages on the site. And nothing's working. Everybody's still dropping off, right? We had one team actually going to try to rebrand the funnel, against my wishes, um, <laughs> to see if that will happen, right? And that took way longer than it should have. They said two weeks, and it was four months. Um, yay. Uh, <laughs> and when they launched it, it didn't make a difference, right? And it's because we actually didn't understand why people were leaving, right? Wrong solution, because we didn't understand the problem. So the problem with um, e-commerce sites like this is that it's really hard to target your customers to talk to them when they're on this website and you don't know who they are. So we have all these strangers out there trying to land on our site and bailing. We haven't collected anything from them to follow up with them. If you do usability tests, what happens is they come in and they just give you feedback on if you can get through the funnel, but not if you want to get through the funnel. So we had to figure out why people are leaving. Um, I had no idea how to do this, and my developer said, I found this thing called Qualaroo. Um, and what Qualaroo does is it pops up on the page when people are going towards the back button, and it says, what's stopping you? And he put in there, what's stopping you from leaving today? And he said, we could, I could pop this in in an hour, and we could see if it works. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's going to answer that field, but like, this is great. But is it, is it right to put an open field? And he's like, well, I could change it if it doesn't work. And I said, OK, fine. So we, we put it up there. And within a week, we had 2,000 responses. 2,000 responses. I was wrong. <laughs> so, and they weren't what we thought they were from that original brainstorm, right? I want a free gift, or I want to try this for free. No. The biggest problem that we found was people cannot find the menu of what they're going to get in the box, right? That never came up, never came up in the brainstorm. Second one was what's in the box. Like, what do I get? Um, Third one was finally the price is too high, and that was only 17% of people, right, who were leaving. So 
That one, too, we're thinking maybe it's not the price is too high compared to competitors. Maybe they're not our target people, or we're not explaining why our price is higher than competitors. We had organic food compared to everybody else, but that's not really shown on the website. So knowing this, so we can start to tackle things. Now our obstacle is that people can't find the menu, right? So we tried a couple things to see if we could put the menu where people would be dropping off. And the first experiment we tried was on this sign-up page. So this is where everybody's leaving on the delivery page. We put up here, like, what's on the menu, what's in the first box, how does it work, those types of things, to see if people would click on it. Um, and it helped a little bit, but we realized we're not solving the real problem there, right? So the real problem was that this was the home page, and this is the menu of the home page. They were using a hamburger button on a desktop, and if you don't know what a hamburger button means, that's what those three little lines are that you see on your mobile where it slides out. And they were hiding everything. They were hiding all the information. So it's a beautiful page. It looks great. It's like very well branded. Looks amazing. It has zero information on it. So people cannot, <laughs> looks fantastic. So people cannot make a logical decision about what they're trying to buy. So they're getting into that signup flow looking for more information and still not finding it. This was the biggest problem. So we said, we have to expand this. We have to make it something that people can see, oh, menu, this is what I need, and go to it very quickly. So we said, we want to roll out a couple new pages that help explain to people why they should buy it, what they're going to get in the box, um, and what the menu is. So I said, let's do a first test first. Let's just put out the menu so that people can find it. And I got a lot of pushback. Everybody said, well, if we just put menu up there, like we don't have anything else in the navigation, that's terrible. Like, we can't just put menu in the navigation. And I'm like, cost of delay, people. Like, you're losing these many people every week, and you could be making this much money, right? Like, let's just put menu up there. So I compromised, um, and I told them just throw up um, FAQs and help, which were already pages up there, because this is one large site. And we launched it, and they doubled acquisition. So, so we increased the conversion rate, hit the target, um, and then eventually they went back and started rolling out all the other pages and making this a page that kept getting progressively better, right? So we rolled out another page that helped get to a further acquisition target. And this is the only thing that was standing in their way of actually reaching their goals. But they had all these ideas going around that were not going to help them get there. And because they weren't testing those ideas, they couldn't really find out what was the best solution until we did this. So the thing with experimentation, too, is that it didn't take one experiment to get us there. We did a bunch of experiments to get there. Um, and experimentation is hard. <laughs> because Amazon has a great statistic that only one in 20 experiments actually succeed. So you have to be in there for the long haul. But the thing is, if you're experimenting, around the wrong things, you're not learning, right? So you have to, there is no failed experiment if you're learning, and it helps you be actionable with the next thing you do. So you have to make sure that your experiments are actually worthwhile. So the reason that we experiment as well is because it reduces uncertainty. So everything that we learn helps reduce uncertainty around what we should be building. That moves us closer to our goals. And that's really the biggest thing that I want you to take away from this. But the problem now, is that experimenting is a new black. Um, everybody read the Lean Startup, and they decided that they should be experimenting. But they're not really doing it well, because they're not learning at the end of the day. They're just doing a lot of experiments out there because they think it's the right thing to do. This is what I call experiment theater. Um, so it's like, look, we're doing all these experiments. We've done 40 of them. Fantastic, you're working, right? And we all take a bow, and we say, ta-da, we did something. Um, and at the end of the day, though, you know, we're very happy, but our users are like, I want a refund. <laughs> this was not a good show, because it did not help me. So at the end of the day here, we're not really helping our users. So this is the next problem. We're measuring success still on outputs rather than outcomes. And you see this a lot in companies. So what happens is we always end up building these features and launching them, but we're not measuring their success. Because we, we think that success just means done. It's done, it's out the door, we shipped it, and that's it. We're not actually tying it to the outcomes that we want to achieve for our users. Um, so some of that is a little bit of our fault, because when we promise, we go in and we promise agile methods, we're talking about velocity and burn down charts and, ooh, oh no, it did it, okay, and burn down charts and flow. Um, 
And we're talking about delivering working software, right? So we're talking about delivering a lot, but we're not talking about what that should be doing at the end of the day. So we don't talk about what we should be putting into this machine to get the right things. So that happens, um, so that causes these managers to micromanage all the features and all the little things that are coming out, but not looking at the big picture of what are we actually achieving here. So we really need to focus on outcomes over outputs if we want to be successful with this. If we want to introduce great product management and good experimentation, if we're not focusing on outcomes and we're only looking at outputs, we're going to fail. So we need to take a shift in actually doing that. And that's what the product strategy canvas really does too. It helps you actually look at outcomes. So if we're aligning our product strategies around these goals, we're not worried about the features. So this helps us too make goals for the people who should be managing it, right? Top line people own the vision. That middle manager, Jim, he should be owning that challenge. He should be judged for success by how much he's doing to try to get people to save more, right? That should be the thing that he really cares about. And the teams should be looking at the target condition, how they're trying to reach that all together. So this helps manage for outcomes instead of outputs. But there's still a problem with this, of course. Um, I think this was really interesting. I was with Jeff Patton um, last week at Mind the Product, and he was telling me that he does this activity with uh, people in his, in his classes, in the workshops that he teaches, where he has them all stand up at the beginning, and he says, line up in according to the success of your last feature release. So he has people who had an awful feature release go down there, people who had a really awesome one go down there, and he makes them line up. And what he observes is we've got about 20% of people in the awful range down there, just a few people over there, right? We've got some people over here in the awesome range, but about 60% of people are in the valley of meh. Um, <laughs> he does not call it the valley of meh, I couldn't remember what he called it, so that, yeah, I like the word meh, because that kind of describes it, right? It was, it was good enough. <laughs> I didn't lose my job, so good enough, right? Um, and the interesting thing to observe, though, with this is that for large companies, this is success, right? It's the awesome and the valley of meh is success, right? And failure only happens if it completely tanks. So that's how we're judging success metrics in very large companies. So on the flip side of that, for startups, if you're not awesome, you'll die, right? If you're not better than competitors, if you're not delivering that awesome, they'll go out of business. They'll lose all of their customers. So their threshold is very different. And it's because they're constrained by money too, right? Large companies are not constrained by money. They have lots of money, even though it doesn't sound like it when you're trying to fight for a budget. But they have a lot of money to sustain themselves. So they're not, so meh is all right. We're okay with that because it, we're not really tracking it. We don't really care. So this kind of screws up our success metrics um, of how we look at it. So when I go into large companies and they tell me we want the startup mindset, you can't have a startup mindset if you're only happy with meh, right? They think the startup mindset is about wearing cool clothes and jeans and, uh, you know, like, culture and ping pong tables and, and you know, experimenting. Um, but it's not really. It's that startups either innovate or die, right? They either do a really, really good job or they're out of business. That's a startup mindset. So until we fix that problem, it's going to be hard to get large companies to actually think like a startup. Another thing, too, is that startups, when they're small, because they have to focus on that success part here, too, they're very in tune with the customer. They're trying to make sure they're satisfying the needs for that customer as much as possible. Because if they don't have a buyer at the end of the day, they're out of business again. And that's also what happens that we see at large companies not doing product management right. Also large startups, too, those are the places I work with, is that they don't focus on the customer. So we lose this connection with them, this way of really understanding what they're doing. So I see this happen a lot where I'll ask people, what's the problem you're trying to solve for your customer? And they go, customers don't have custom dashboards. And I go, great, what's the solution? Custom dashboards. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> right? That's not a problem, right? So Customers' problems are not your lack of features. No customer is sitting there going, I just want a custom dashboard. Or they might be doing that, but they really have a goal at the end of the day, right? There's a goal that they're actually trying to solve. On, in line with that, customers' problems are not your problems. So another one that I hear 
is I'll say, what problem are you trying to solve here for your customers? And they'll go, as a user, I want to engage with this site, but it's boring. Um, and this, I hear it all the time. It's like, I can't engage. As a user, I can't engage. I can't try your thing. I can't do this thing. Um, but customers, at the end of the day, are like, I don't care about engaging, right? Like, I just want to get my thing. I want you to solve my problem. So the thing is, we are biased inside these companies, and it's something we have to remember. We are biased towards what we want. We are not, at the end of the day, sitting on the, the other side trying to have our problem solved. And if we continually stay inside our companies, we're going to remain biased because whether you like it or not, your colleagues all think like you because you're all in the same environment. You're not actually experiencing the problems that the customers are at the end of the day. So the only way to fight your bias is to get out and talk to your users directly. It's the only way that you will fight your bias. But companies aren't doing this. Um, they don't like user research. So many of the companies I go into, they'll, have, they'll either not do any user research or they'll have a user research division that's like over here that nobody really talks to that puts out reports on what their users are doing. But there's no feedback on if those reports are directly related to what you're building at the end of the day. So most product managers I talk to do not talk to customers. They've never talked to a customer. Some of them go, but I'm the customer because I use our product. You're not your customer. Um, and they don't get out there and really talk to people. And it's also because companies see that as a waste. Uh, I hate this. I always see things like this. It says, use research on a budget, right? Like, we'll teach you how to use research with only 1000 bucks. And for some reason, companies think user research is expensive. They think talking to people is expensive. Um, and it's because we're in that mindset of velocity and delivering things, right? If we're not coding, if we're not designing, that's a waste. Right? Why should we ever talk to people? So I really like this line, too. It's from um, Gift Constable, and Jeff's been using it as well, that says, when we're thinking about things to build, this is how we should really look at it. We have confidence over here of if, we're building, if what we're building is the right thing, and we have investment down here of how much money we should be putting into things at that time of confidence. So the thing about user research is it's down here. It's actually not expensive to do. It's very low investment to go out and talk to people. If you go immediately and start building things and software, you have very low confidence that it's the right thing to do. Um, and it's very large investment to actually build software because you have to maintain software at the end of the day. So if you go out and talk to users, it takes 30 minutes of your time and there is no waste. You will learn something. I guarantee if you go talk to a user today, you will learn something you didn't know. So that's not waste. That's actually a really great thing that we should be doing, but we don't. Instead, we go talk to our customers, customers, the internal business people, and gather requirements, right? So I really like this Dilbert. I'll let you read it for a minute. <laughs> It's funny because it's true. Um, <laughs> so that's what we do. Uh, one, of, one of my, I always do, before I do a product training, I interview a bunch of product managers who will be in the training, and I ask them what they're doing now. And I say, who is your customer? And they always tell me, this person on marketing, this person in sales, this person over here in this IT department. Like, it's always an internal person. And I say, okay, well, who are your users? It's never an internal person, right? If it's an internal person, that's great. If you're talking to them, fantastic. But if you're building things for outside consumers um, or even B2B companies, I ask them, when was the last time you actually talked to those users? Oh, never, right? So we're losing really touch, we're losing touch with that. So your colleagues are not your customers unless you're building an internal tool. We have to get outside and actually start talking to our users to understand what we should be building for them. So every time I ever bring this up, though, People go, but Melissa, users don't know what they want. I went to the user, I asked them what they want, I built them that, and they go, this is not what I want, and, but it's the thing that they told me to build. You're asking the wrong questions, right? <laughs> so if, you're, if this is happening to you, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> because you should not be asking users, what do you want? You should be trying to understand their problems. You should be trying to empathize with them at the right time so that they're experiencing the problem to understand how to solve it. It's not your user's job to know what they want at the end of the day. It is their job to know what problems they have. 
It's your job to figure out how to solve those problems. It's never your user's job to figure out how to solve the problems. They could do it themselves, right? Why are they paying you? So this is something that we have to remember. If we're going out and doing user research, we're not asking people what they want. We're trying to understand what it is that we can deliver to them. So at the end of the day, too, we talk about value a lot in companies. And we say, like, we're trying to maximize value. We're trying to do this. Solving problems for your users deliver value. Because if you don't have anything to buy, anybody to buy your product at the end of the day, there is no value in your company. Your company has to solve a problem for somebody or something or some industry at the end of the day. So that's really what we should be focusing on is solving big problems for customers so that we can create big business value. These things are interlinked. They're not separate. There's a lot of companies that actually do this very well. John Deere. Um, I was in Iowa, of all places, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was a fun conference. <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of people from John Deere there. And they said, oh, well, we've been, you know, all of our product managers go out to the farms and sit with our users at least once a month. And I was like, holy crap, that's awesome. How long have you been doing that? And they're like, forever. I've been there for 14 years, and they've been doing it for 14 years. It's ingrained in their culture that product owners go out and sit on the farms, and they help them. They put them to work. They're like, this is what we have to do, right? So that they understand what they should be building for their users. Developers go out at least once a year. It's mandatory that they go out at least once a year, but they try to go more often. A lot of them like going more often. They get to really see the people using the things that they build. It's ingrained in their culture that their customers are their highest priority, and they need people to understand it. Disney does this too. Disney sends all their employees to walk around the park all the time. They're like, go out, walk around the park, right? Go see how people are interacting with things. See how they're experiencing it. Talk to them. Get to know them. Try to figure out what we're building for them. So a lot of large companies are doing this. It's not a scary thing, user research. It's valuable. It's something that really helps us. And we can't be afraid to actually talk to our users. So when we talk to our users and we learn more about them, we can discover and learn and feed that into our delivery process. So a lot of times people think delivery and discovery are two separate things, two phases, and we're going to just deliver. We'll discover for a week, and then we'll go into deliver mode for a year. And then maybe we'll discover again later, but <laughs> probably not. Um, <laughs> but it's not true. If you really want to make a successful product, this should be a loop. You should be discovering a little bit, delivering a little bit, learning from that, which is another discover phase, right? and putting it back into the next thing you deliver. This needs to be a continuous loop of learning. So it's not two distinct phases. And that's what we have to really try to remember. So let me go back to the beginning. How did we actually get here? So how did we get here? Um, so we're not planning. We're planning. We're not experimenting with our product strategy. We're treating our colleagues as customers. We're focusing internally on our problems and not our customers' problems still. And we're stuck in the build trap. So how did we actually get here? So let's go back to the beginning. How do we get 1,400 product managers <laughs> to hate Agile, to hate what we're doing? Well, for better or for worse, Agile is now a fad, and everybody's doing it, right? Everybody wants to see Agile. And it's because somehow we figured out how to monetize this. We figured out how to make money off being Agile and how to sell it. So a lot of big players are getting into the games as well. Um, and they're selling things like Safe. <laughs> They're selling things like safe. Um, so most companies who are operating on Agile are using some kind of form of Scrum or safe. But they're going through that safety dance, right, the motions, and they're not really understanding why they're doing it. And when we train product owners in a safe model or in a Scrum model, we're training them to be beholden to the colleagues that are inside their company, right? We're not training them to actually be in touch with their users. And when you look at the state of what our education is for product owners or for product managers, it's pretty dismal. So a couple weeks ago, I was invited to Yale to give a lecture to a class that was studying modern software methods. This is Yale, right? Yale MBAs. Um, and I went in and I said, OK, great. I'm going I'm to teach them all about product management and agile and all these things. And they're like, great, because all these people here, all these like 150 people you're talking to, they want to be product managers at the end of the day. That's their goal. So I said, great, what are they learning right now? Well, we're spending a month teaching them Agile. Fantastic, what are they reading? The Essentials of Scrum. And I read the book, The Essentials of Scrum, and there's like one page on product ownership and talking to users with user personas that's not really good. 
And it doesn't really teach you how to get into your users. So I went in and of course I just gave him kind of the same talk I'm giving to you um, and said this is what good product management looks like. And all the questions were, but how do I figure out velocity points? And how do I get my developers to build the things I want them to build? Or how do I get my managers to actually understand what product management was? So this is the state of our, our education for product managers, right? So normally, a lot of people, in our case, who understand Agile go, well, they just don't understand Agile. And this is what I hear, and this is what I said for a very long time. They just don't understand Agile. So they're doing it wrong. But Agile never really cared about the user at the end of the day anyway. So are they really misunderstanding Agile? And how are we teaching them Agile? So most people have to get certified as a product owner when they work in SAFE or with Scrum or in these large companies. And this is the product owner curriculum. Um, we're going to develop a clear product charter. This is, I, I studied a bunch of product owner curriculums. Very few of them ever talk about the users at the end of the day. They talk about product charters, grooming the backlog, defining the backlog, applying a methodical approach for prioritizing items, um, giving a clear view of individual roles, responsibilities, and how they interact, and produce accurate plans for fixed scope. Right? This is how we train product owners. This is what we tell people is how you'll be successful as a product owner in these organizations. And I will tell you, these are the only people who have a say over what we build, too, because they're getting the plans down. There is nobody above them, usually, who are doing the discovery process to understand their users, because we told them somehow that this is enough. This is enough to build great products. And we got, we see other things popping up. I found this thing, scruminstitute.org. I don't know what it is, but when I searched for product owner curriculums, this was like the second or third result, and they certify you for 29 bucks. And if you fail, <laughs> you can keep taking it. And their things, benefits, it says, <laughs> it will help you win projects with your qualified employees, and it will improve employee satisfaction. It will reduce costs by improving your efficiency of teams. Um, it will be your proof of competence for 29 bucks. Um, so whether or not like, we think this is funny, it exists, right? Um, it actually exists out there. And this is what we're telling people they need to learn when we go in and we train Agile. So this also leads to questions where, um, when I was in Iowa, this came up when we were having an open discussion. It says, do we even need product owners? This legitimately came up from somebody who's pretty well known in this community. Do we even need product owners? And the answer is no, we don't need product owners that do this, right? We don't need product owners that spend 40 hours a week writing user stories. Somebody else can definitely do that. But we do need good product owners. <laughs> we need good product owners who understand the user and can help deliver value for the user by recognizing that there's uncertainty and taking you through that discovery process. That's what we need to be successful. So, at the end of the day, we have to remember, Agile's not enough. Agile's not enough to get us out of the build trap. We need more things. We need to understand strategy from a holistic concept. We need product management. So Jeff also wrote out, <laughs> when we were at Mind the Product, is it time to call out the Agile dogmatists for doing damage? I know they're hurting something I care about. And that's how I kind of feel, too. Because when we do go in, if the dogmatists go in and they say, you know, Agile is enough. This is what will help you make great products. They're not doing anybody a favor. That's how we get 1,400 people, 1,400 product managers clapping that they hate Agile. That's not, hurt, that's not helping the cause. And that's not how we get out of the build trap. But it's really easy to stay in the build trap, right? We're putting ourselves in there for not doing anything about it. So I want to leave you with this. What are you going to do about this? So if you're new to Agile, what are you doing? Are you questioning the things that you're being taught? Are you trying to figure out why you're going through the motions? If you're training people in Scrum and SAFE, are you leading the dance? Or are you helping people understand why they're applying these practices? If you're a leader in this community, are you letting the dogmatists just get away with selling this stuff? Or are you stepping up to help educate people? And if you're a product owner, are you actually caring about your users? That's it. Thank you.